Hello, I'm Richard Murphy. I've made a video about what I think is wrong with accounting in the 21st century. Please have a look at that because that lays the groundwork for this video, which is about the audit of the accounts of companies, particularly in the UK, but elsewhere in the 21st century, as we are now, 2021. There has been and has always been throughout my career as a chartered accountant, a crisis of confidence in auditors. There's a thing called the expectation gap with regard to audit. People think that auditors exist for reasons that are not true. They therefore have expectations of auditors that will always be unfulfilled unless they understand what audit is about. The difficulty is that auditors themselves have in recent years, certainly since the turn of the century, increased that expectation gap by confusing the whole story about what they're doing when they undertake their work, which is fundamentally to provide an opinion on what is called the truth or fairness of the accounts that they examine for a particular company for a particular year. Let me explain this. Auditors are appointed by a company. Very few people apart from companies have auditors. The auditors are appointed by the board of the company. Bizarrely, they of course are the people who they will be checking. The auditors in law in most countries are required to, to report to the shareholders of the company. As you will have noted from my video on accounting, if you've watched it, I think that is inadequate because the shareholders are only one of seven groups with a very particular interest in the activities of any company that might be subject to audit. So we miss out the trading partners, the employees, the regulators, the tax authorities, civil society, and the other suppliers of capital to the company when restricting the audit report simply to the shareholders. So by definition, the audit report is sent to a tiny minority of those who should get it and to whom the auditors should be responsible. But there's something worse. When I started my audit career, and that was in 1979, I worked for what was then called Pete Marwick Mitchell & Co. Now that's part of KPMG. The PM in the middle of KPMG came from the firm that I trained with. I trained with them in London. It was then one of the biggest firms and one of the biggest offices of accountants in the world. What we sought to do was offer an opinion on the truth and fairness of the accounts. And what I saw partners doing was standing back and going, I don't like that, I want that changed. I think this is inadequate disclosure, I need more information on that, or whatever. Frankly, there was quite a lot of judgment involved in the process of auditing. But, and this is where problems arose, two things were the consequence of that. One was some audits were not good enough, the judgment was not sound, and therefore there were demands for auditing standards to prove that audits had been done. And at that time, every single limited company in the UK required an audit, from the tiniest to the largest. Now it is well under 10% too. But there was a demand that there be auditing standards so that everybody worked to the same supposed quality. The second thing was that once auditors realised that they were being held to account for working to auditing standards, they shifted the goalposts. And they wrote those standards to say that in practice, what used to be called true and fair, which was the exercise of judgment, was now true and fair, which meant that the accounts complied with a set of accounting standards. And that was assisted by the fact that from 2005 onwards, the whole world, apart from USA and Japan and one or two other places, have used one set of accounting standards, the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation standards. And actually those for the USA are not that different from IFRS and Japan has its own separate rules. But the point was, from then on, compliance with a set of rules was what was required. Judgment went out of the window. But people still thought that auditors were using their judgment. They aren't. They're simply saying, I can tick the box, the rules are being followed, that's enough. And people thought that auditors were always looking for fraud, when frankly, they're not. They're only looking for fraud that is big enough to change your view of the accounts. Now, the term there is materiality. And materiality means that the figure, the fraud that is giving rise to 
the problem that they've identified is in big enough for it to actually affect the way the accounts look. So to use a recent example, Patisserie Valerie's account said there was cash in the business when there wasn't and the difference was big enough to make a material difference to the way in which the account should have been presented. That was a fraud that should have been discovered by audit. But most frauds are pretty small and they're not therefore found by audit. So we have two fundamental problems. One, people thinking that auditors are looking for fraud when most of the time they're not and frankly couldn't because they aren't paid enough to do that and they're reliant upon the directors to maintain the books and records of the company in a way that find fraud. That's what the law, that's where the law says that the responsibility is. And second, people think that auditors are using their judgment on what true and fair is when in fact all they're simply doing is saying the rules have been followed. Now that throws us back onto accounting then. Because if the rules of accounting are wrong, and the rules of accounting have, in my opinion, been very wrong in some cases in the last 15 or so years since we got IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards, then the auditors will say the accounts are right, even though they're hopelessly inaccurate. And we've seen examples of that. For example, there's a lot of flexibility in the accounting rules for the recognition of income on what are called long-term contracts. Things like building contracts, long-term construction contracts, things like building a railway line, things like building a hospital, which allow considerable judgment to companies about when they will actually declare profits or not. And sometimes those things have been exploited, but the auditors haven't been able to say so because the rules have been followed. And actually, their rule that says if the boxes have been ticked, then everything is okay, has prevented them basically, they think, saying, hey, hang on, something's wrong here. So we have got an expectation gap on audit. It's true that auditors are failing to live up to our hopes, but the point is, are the government's reforms with regard to audit, which they have announced and which are currently subject to consultation, really going to answer the questions as to whether audit is going to be reformed to meet our expectations? That will be the subject of another video. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in what I've been saying in this video, please subscribe. There is a button below the viewing screen. If you're interested in what I have to say on Twitter, I'm at Richard J. Murphy on that medium. If you want to look at my blog, that's taxresearch.org.uk. And we have a Facebook page as well, Richard J. Murphy. So one of those things will get you more information on what this video series is about. And I hope I'll see you again soon.